about saying exactly what you think. So Peter and I worked together in the 1990s at yes, uh, St George's Hospital, and uh, then he we disappeared to the frozen north, and he's going to tell you a story of what happened when he got there. Thank you very much, Professor Kirby, ladies and gentlemen. Put that on. Yes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm Peter Duffy. I'm ex-consultant surgeon to Morecambe Bay Hospitals NHS Trust in the northwest of England. And I trained here in London. I'm very grateful for the chance to tell you what it's like being a, a bang up to date NHS whistleblower. I was unfairly constructively dismissed or if you prefer illegally sacked from the NHS in 2016 after well over a third of a century of service starting right here at Charing Cross Hospital in 1982. I won my case just months ago. You won't be surprised to hear that I've got some really very strong feelings about NHS whistleblower protection. What happened? Well, the background is here. We had a, a long series of clinical errors, which I've, I've summarised here for you. Please note the near identical nature to the midwifery crisis, which of course triggered the Morecambe Bay inquiry and the Kirkup report from 2015. The Trust have not denied that I flagged up critical clinical issues, including avoidable deaths, avoidable harm, and near misses, nor that I was a serious and a sincere whistleblower. Now, in that same year, 2015, we had another predicted avoidable death and a subsequent act of gross disobedience to Her Majesty's coroner over her investigation <coughs> into that death. With the obvious similarities to the Morecambe Bay midwifery scandal, including attempts to throw the coroner's inquiries, ongoing risk taking, no feedback or support, and no meaningful internal action, I felt that by this point I had no choice but to go to the CQC. My colleagues positively lined up to warn me to expect a career accident. This is what happened to me, beginning just days after the CQC opened their inquiries. By the summer of 2016, it was clear to everyone, including the BMA, my solicitor, my GP, occupational health, that I had to resign for my own protection. Having been forced into resignation, the Trust refused any face-to-face -face meetings with me for three months whilst I worked out my notice, despite me being made the Trust's Doctor of the Year in the meantime by the frontline staff and patients on the basis of treating everyone as equals and always going the extra mile. The clinical errors continued. By late summer 2016, I was unemployed and it seemed unemployable. In 2017, I was asked to go and work for the Manx DHSS and I live on my own on the Isle of Man now. My wife, sons, other family, relatives and friends still live in Lancaster in the Morecambe Bay area. It really does feel like being two years into a 10 year prison sentence. Now, this of course is all depressingly familiar territory for anybody interested in NHS whistleblowing. After the Francis report, whistleblower guardians, all of the recent NHS scandals, including of course Morgan Bay itself, and all the expressions of support and promises of protection for NHS whistleblowers, has anything changed? Well, there's supposed to be three layers of whistleblower protection or safety nets for those who make that leap of faith and speak out on behalf of the patients. These three safety nets are firstly, the NHS's promises themselves. Secondly, the assurances and the pledges from the regulators, the guardians, politicians and healthcare leaders. And thirdly, the law itself. So how did these three safety nets perform for me after I'd been dismissed? Well, first, the NHS. These are the typical kind of generic NHS promises that were repeated in Morecambe Bay's Freedom to Speak Up webpage. Not only did Morecambe Bay clearly and repeatedly violate this promise, indeed, I think they drove a coach and horses through it, but the promise then disappeared off their webpage during the period of the tribunal. 
I'm sorry, it doesn't predict terribly well. There we are. Uh, and there it's gone. So the promise was deleted after I'd pointed it out in my witness statement to the tribunal. Clearly, the NHS does not make these promises with any intention of keeping them and is even prepared to pretend that they're not there in the first place. So the promises about protecting whistleblowers from detriment and dismissal are openly broken and clearly mean nothing. And the first safety net simply doesn't exist. So, how about the second safety net? The regulators, the guardians, the medical and political leaders and their promises and pledges. Did they do any better in holding the NHS to its vanishing promises of whistleblower protection? Well, here's a list of all the leaders and the guardians and the regulators who were fully aware of what had happened to me and the threats and the false allegations that led up to and followed my unfair uh, constructive dismissal. And here's a list of all of those who actually made any effort whatsoever to help me and my family step in and protect patients and hold the NHS to its promises. So the unavoidable conclusion, I'm afraid, is that the second safety net doesn't exist either. So that leaves the law, the final safety net. How did the law do? Well, in my opinion, the law fails whistleblowers in at least three critical areas. Firstly, in an employment tribunal, you would logically expect the emphasis to be on the whistleblowing, the clinical errors and the actions of the dismissing NHS trust and its managers. But no, you, the whistleblower, are the one on trial. It's your character, behaviour, integrity and reputation that will be impugned with every attempt made to smear and discredit you in the eyes of the tribunal. It is standard practice for the NHS Trust to trawl back through years of emails, HR records, occupational health records and so on in order to find anything with which to censure or degrade you and your reputation under hostile cross-examination. It is a horrible experience and it simply allows the NHS to indulge in yet another round of whistleblower victimisation and abuse. The next area where whistleblowers have failed is over the issue of cost threats. The NHS can generate truly huge legal bills knowing it's all underwritten by the taxpayer anyway. These bills are totted up and the whistleblower and their family directly threatened with costs if they don't drop the case and agree to a gag. The threat is huge, in my case, into six figures, and it tactically arrives at the last minute. You can't tell the tribunal that you, the whistleblower, and main witness are being threatened and intimidated, as the letter is without prejudice, so you're not allowed to disclose it. In my case, we very much diluted and reduced my pleadings to try and head off such threats, but it's a measure of the animosity felt towards me that despite losing the substantive part of the case, Morecambe Bay came after me for costs anyway. Finally, the law demands an evidential link between whistleblowing and constructive dismissal if the whistleblower is to receive full compensation. It's not enough to show that you blew the whistle and shortly later you were illegally sacked. The tribunal needs an evidential smoking gun to link the two. This evidential link is an almost impossible task, particularly with the NHS conducting a scorched earth policy to evidence right from the start. For example, in the run up to my hearing and after a meeting between senior management and the department, all eight of my definite and all four of my possible Morecambe Bay witnesses dropped out and gave back word. The main and the most important third party witness was informed they will only be appearing for the trust and having refused to sign the statement written out for them to sign and rewritten it, they were then informed that neither they nor their evidence would be allowed before the tribunal. With additional NHS tactics like email evidence being redacted, 200, uh, or not being declared and with the NHS taking an approach to evidence of witnesses that in my opinion would be more appropriate to southern Italy in the 1970s. It's hardly surprising that overall 
only about 3% of claimants succeed in going through to fully win their cases against such tactics. So to sum up my case, we have NHS promises of whistleblower protection repeatedly broken and deleted, leaders who don't show leadership, regulators who don't regulate, guardians who don't hold organisations to account, and a law which simply exposes whistleblowers to more hate, threats, intimidation and allegations. Now I'd like to just take the last few minutes just to look at three specific areas of NHS whistleblowing. Firstly, there's what I would call the whistleblower catch-22. Do you speak up in the interest of your patients, but against the interests of your organisation and managers, and risk a career assassination? Or do you stay quiet and become complicit in the risk-taking and the cover-up, in which case you may quite rightly lose your registration? So remember, the errors and the neglect are not yours. Apart from having tighter standards, than some colleagues and managers, you have done precisely nothing wrong. But either way, you potentially lose everything. Your vocation, your reputation, family, income, the lot. Secondly, bear in mind that you are, after all, jeopardising other people's smooth career progression and the organisation's ruthless spin and reputation management. So don't underestimate the amount of hatred that you, that you will attract. In my case, for example, despite being described in the Doctor of the Year Award as always going the extra mile, there was a sworn allegation made against me based on entirely fabricated evidence that I had claimed for up to £112,000 of NHS funds that I was potentially not entitled to. People have ended up struck off and with custodial sentences for less than that. Do not underestimate the hatred that NHS whistleblowers attract. And thirdly, consider this. Take a long, hard look at the actions of the politicians and the guardians and the regulators over the plight of NHS whistleblowers and their families. The actions. Forget the tired slogans and the empty, vacuous catchphrases have these leaders actually engaged, rolled up their sleeves and waded in as though they really genuinely want to protect whistleblowers, their families and vulnerable patients? Or have they instead shown total disinterest and indifference, demonstrating that behind the false promises and the dodgy statistics, they're quite comfortable with the ongoing brutal, dirty and dare I say it, corrupt targeting of vulnerable NHS whistleblowers? and of course equally content with the unwritten but crystal clear message that their inactivity sends out to the NHS as a whole. I'd finish by saying this, in the wake of scandals like Midstaffs, Morecambe Bay, Gosport, Shrewsbury and Telford and so on, potential whistleblowers are currently caught between on the one hand the increasing regulatory pressure on us and rising public and media expectations that staff will speak up. Yet on the other hand, we have truly massive political disinterest and hypocrisy, ruthless NHS reputation management, spin and legal and regulatory indifference to the plight of the whistleblower when they have spoken up. Professor Kirby, ladies and gentlemen, based on my experience, I would say there has never, never been a more dangerous time for frontline NHS staff to consider speaking up in defence of their patients. Thank you. Well, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? Um, it? Actually, it reminds me, in this room we had David Sellew, the uh, surgeon who was sent to prison for gross negligence manslaughter. And uh, I think Peter's and David's uh, very emotional talks are, uh, actually both resonated to the audience.